Welcome to episode number 180 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and today I have, and we have, the good fortune and pleasure of speaking with Linda Boff, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of General Electric. And we're going to talk about digital transformation and the internet of large machines and all kinds of exciting topics. Linda, how are you today? I'm great, Michael. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, 180 is my lucky number. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be on and uh, really excited to talk to you and, and, uh, and your audience. So, uh, so let's get started. Great. Well, thanks so much. Linda, I know everybody has, has heard of GE, but tell us a little about the history and tell us, tell us about GE in the present. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, GE is 124 years old. We sort of like to think of ourselves as the, the world's old, oldest startup, if you will. We were founded by somebody who most people know, Thomas Edison, um, who invented and really more famously commercialized the light bulb. Um, we're a company that's in you know 170 countries. We've got well over 300,000 employees. We're in big industries, industries like health, and energy and transportation through locomotives and aviation. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the interesting thing about GE, particularly as a, as a marketer, is not that people don't know GE. Our awareness is high, particularly in a country like the United States. It's we really want people to understand GE and who we are in 2016 and the company that we've become. And in the last 10, 15 years, our chairman, Jeff Immelt, has really transformed the portfolio of the company. And, you know, the three industries I mentioned, rail, aviation, so that's transportation, health and energy, um, are the focus of the company. But what I think is really interesting, and you and I are going to obviously be talking about this a lot, is that, you know, GE's been a kind of company that, uh, that makes things. Today, we're a company that makes and connects things. And we use the term um, uh, GE as a digital industrial. Um, we talk about the industrial internet, the internet of really big things, connecting big iron and big data. So, you know, the the GE that, that we want people to know is a company that's a digital company as well as an industrial company. That's a big change from the company that we've always been. So digital transformation, we hear that term a lot. And you've just alluded to some of the components or the characteristics of digital transformation, meaning connecting things. And so can you describe digital transformation at GE? What does that mean for you yeah. in this huge industrial complex? Yes. Complex uh, uh, <laughs> company, I meant to say. Company, corporation, all of those things, all of the above, right? So, you know, here's what it means. Um, you know, today we've got great machines um, that, um, uh, uh, that help to power the world, that help to create renewable energy, that diagnose in hospitals. Um, but the world that we're imagining is a world where those machines talk to each other and where big sets of machines, big sets of turbines can share information. So imagine, Michael, a jet engine that can tweet and tell you that it's time to come off engine, that it's time to be serviced. Imagine what we think of, what we call a digital twin. And a digital twin very simply is if you're running a, a wind turbine farm and you literally have a digital imprint of that farm and therefore you know when the machines are their most productive, when the machines need to be serviced, think about how much more productive you can be. So when we think about digital industrial, we think about the industrial internet, we think about a world that's more productive. We think about a world that's more efficient. We think about fuel savings. And again, in our world, we op GE operates in a world of scale. So you save a mile of, of, uh, of uh, uh, fuel for a big railroad, it's worth millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, we get, as you can tell, really kind of giddy talking about what a connected um, ecosystem of machines looks like. I mean, we think and the industry thinks that the industrial internet will be bigger than the consumer internet. So that's a lot to get excited about. Some people sort of call it um, 
um, industry 4.0, right? The next big industrial revolution. So this change that you're describing, connecting these large machines and adding a layer of data and analytics to these large machines, obviously there are major implications for the technology, but from a marketing perspective, you're, you're after all the CMO, Linda, from a marketing perspective, what does this mean for how you tell the GE story and for, for marketing at a company like General? Yeah, no, I, I mean, so much, right? You know, I mean, I often say, so I'm going to kind of take a step back, Michael, if it's okay. I often say that when we, when we talk about GE, we can show up a couple different ways, right? We can show up as a company, and I, I sort of did this myself as you first asked me about GE, and sort of give you our facts and figures, right? We're in, you know, this number of countries, we've got this number of employees, Employees were in these industries. And, and that's all true. What we try to do as a brand, and this will kind of get into how we're now talking about the company as a digital industrial, is we try to talk about the brand in ways that are really human, really accessible, candidly a bit unexpected. People expect GE to be a certain way. They expect us to be a big company. We are a big company, but we're a company made up of fantastic individuals who are passionate who really are on a mission to, um, to make the world work better. So when we think about how do we market digital industrial, um, it can be a little bit of a mouthful, right? So how do you make that real? So one of the things we did, um, and this goes back now to last fall, so I guess we're coming up on a year or so, is we thought about how do you take this idea of being a digital industrial company and just explain it, unpack it a little bit. And so we challenged our agency. We've been with a, uh, an advertising agency called BBDO for 90 plus years. Talk about, you know, powerful relationships um, to help us figure out a way to tell the story. And, and we've done it in a way that's, that's pretty simple, which is, um, uh-oh, Michael, I hope you're seeing me. I'm getting a blue screen. No, you are. You look great. Okay, good. I'm going to just keep talking and, you know, hopefully all's good. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, so we, um, we created this character, a developer named Owen, and we, we shot a series of films with Owen in situ um, with him trying to explain to his parents, to his friends, um, to some fellow developers what does it mean to be a digital industrial? And, and frankly, he did this by talking about a new job that he had gotten at GE. And the new job was to be a developer. And his parents kind of, you know, comforted him and his friends sort of made fun of him. And, you know, it was this very droll, self-deprecating and, and frankly, almost, almost a humble way to be talking about um, what we're doing. And then we kind of ended the, the film by saying, you know, GE, you know, a, a digital company and an industrial company. Funnily enough, um, we didn't do this as a way to recruit people, um, but it turned out to be a recruiting powerhouse with, you know, recruiting up like 800% since we launched these. So, you know, that's one example. I'd say the other thing, and again, we can, you know, take this wherever you want to go, is, you know, we really try to market in the most digitally innovative way that we can. So as we become a digital industrial company, we're also trying to behave in marketing the way a digital industrial company would. So what does that really mean? It means that we try to be first often, and, and certainly we try to be incredibly innovative on new platforms. And that might be anything from, you know, creating a, a, our own podcast to using virtual reality, to being on Vine or Instagram or all kinds of new channels like Poncho and uh, uh, Micmac and others. So, um, so that's a little bit of what we try to do in marketing. And we have a comment from Jill Rowley, who is watching, watching, and she's the queen of social selling, and she says she loves Owen. So, so you are uh, uh, this enormous company, and so I find it very interesting that you say that you're trying to be first on these, these various platforms. 
Yeah. So look, you know, I often say this, which is we try so hard, Michael, to behave the way a person would on social media, not the way a big company would. I don't think people want to talk to big companies. And I know they don't want to talk to big companies when they're on on Twitter or Snapchat or Facebook. Um, You want to talk to somebody the way you talk to them at you know, a cocktail party or something. So we try very hard on social and thank you so much um, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the person you mentioned. Um, we try so hard to, to be human, to be conversational, um, to, to just um, sort of act like a human being would. And I, I, it's kind of advice I've given to other marketers, which is uh, why would you show up in a way that's, that's corporate or that's... Um, overly scripted when, when, you know, you can sort of show your best self and that's what we try to do. And inside, uh, again, such a large company, how do you develop the cultural aspects, the culture behind it to make it work? Because you can't simply put out a corporate edict, act like a person now, that doesn't work. (laughs) How do you do it? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I I think you, 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 in some ways, I think you you do it by starting to do it, right? So, you know, we we kind of decided, um, I don't know, this was maybe four or five years ago, that um, the first thing we did, candidly, Michael, was we, we kind of just cleaned up the house, right? Because, you know, four or five years ago, you and I both remember, um, it, it was possible to have a lot of different social channels, a lot of Facebook channels that kind of were vestiges of, you know, past campaigns. So we sort of said, what's the experience we want people to have? So, you know, how can we have some consistency? Um, The second thing we did or I did was I hired the best people I could possibly find, people who understood um, the way that that, um, digital works, the way that social works. Um, and and that's that's critically important if you're a marketer listening or watching this. Um, and then the the third thing we did was we got on the playing field. You know, we, we didn't read about um, Twitter or Vine or Snapchat. We just started doing it. And you know, so I'll I'll give you an anecdote. The the uh, day they uh, that Twitter announced Vine, um, we uh, we decided that day to go up on Vine. I mean, Vine was, I don't know, it was hours old, Michael, right? It wasn't even days old. And the team had a really clever idea, which was to do a six second science experiment. And for those of you who know Vine, I'm sure most of your your listeners and and viewers do, um, you know, Vine is six seconds. We did this little experiment with a Petri dish filled with um, water and food coloring. And and you dip a Q-tip in it and it kind of um, spirals out in a pretty color. And it was, people loved it. It exploded. And then we did this, um, that led to us doing something called Six Second Science Fair, um, where we invited people to send us their ideas. And it's funny, you know, you experiment, you get a little success, gives you the courage to experiment the next time. And we kept doing that. And I, I think what we have found is by by telling our story and telling our story in different formats, different lengths, could be six seconds, could be 60 minutes, could be six hours sometimes, we found the way we could talk about ourselves and the more comfortable we got with that, the more intrepid we became. If, does that make sense? It does make sense. It's interesting when you talk about humanizing a brand that has to do with industri- an industrial brand and digital with analytics and data and all of that, it seems like an enormous challenge to simplify it to, to the to the point where you can personalize it and can humanize it. Yeah. So you're asking a really, really good question, um, which we've thought about a lot. So, you know, I think brands need to figure out what they stand for. In our case, and you have to figure out what your DNA is. And I, I, you know, if, if a, if a, bar of soap like Dove can figure out that they stand for real beauty, everybody can figure out what their DNA is, right? To me, that's always job one as a marketer. Who are you? The the second is, how do you want to talk about yourself? And and I think for us, it became very clear that science and technology and engineering and invention were topics that, that were important to us, but also important to the world. And we constantly look for, you know, this this intersection. People can see me holding up my little triangle here. And that's an intersection of 
culture and science and innovation. And we look for moments, and it may not be every day, um, but we look for moments that that we can have that conversation. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, you know, we started this, oh God, on uh, uh, March 14th, which for those of you who are math fans is 314 is pi. So pi day. And we had a lot of fun and we said, look, if you, if you send us a tweet on pi day, we'll respond. And we, we, for every, I don't know, like 25th tweet, we sent people an actual pie, blueberry pie, strawberry pie, etc. So that was a lot of fun. And we started to kind of um, make a little bit of a science out of this, if you will. And we did things um, to celebrate uh, in the spring, you know, a time when everybody's going on spring break, we created something called Spring Break It. And we went up to our global research center, one of them, we have them all over the world, but we went to one in Albany. And we used everyday objects, frisbees, uh, beach balls, baseballs, and we took the machines that we used to test our materials. And one of the things GE is really good at is material science, maybe the best company in the world ceramic matrix coatings, you know, all kinds of different material science. So we took these everyday objects and we use the same machines we use for our regular materials and we tried to break things, spring break it. And my favorite was uh, we took a baseball and we compressed it. And um, if you've ever as a kid torn apart a baseball, it's really quite amazing what's inside. And it went viral and it wound up on Imager and Reddit. And, you know, so we found ways, Michael, to kind of take culture and science and find that, that lovely intersection. I'll, I'll, can I give you one more example? Um, because just because it's such a fun one, um, and it's and it's uh, 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 one that sort of speaks to something else we try to do in marketing, and that is reach new audiences. You know, GE because we've been around for 124 years. You know, I think a challenge is how are you relevant every day, and how are you relevant to new audiences? So we thought about okay, you know. Um, how do we take a moment, in this case, it was the 45th anniversary of the moon landing. Um, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon a couple summers ago, two summers ago, I think. And uh, we took uh, the moon boot and GE was part of the moon boot. Our silicone carbide was in the, the iconic boot, first step on the moon, first step for man, giant step for mankind, we all know it. And we recreated them as a pair of sneakers, a pair of kicks. But we did it with our current materials, silicon carbide and, you know, the, the literally the materials that we use. And we worked with a media partner called Thrillist. And we created these actual sneakers. We put them on sale the day of the moon landing. Actually, not just the day, the minute of the moon landing. We put them on sale for $196.69, 1969. And uh, they sold out in, uh, I don't know, seven minutes or something. And uh, they were, they're on sale. They may still be on eBay for about four or $5,000. So, you know, why am I telling you this story and your listeners? I, I think it's because, you know, when you're a company like GE that makes very big and very important technology and now technology that's being digitized, how do you make what we're doing every day? How do you make it relatable? How do you make it tangible? You know, a lot of what we do, wonderful as it is, you take for granted. You know, you take your electricity for granted until it goes out. So by doing something as tangible as a sneaker, we made ourselves very real. We appeal to a, a new audience, in this case, sneaker heads, which is quite a large audience, I've learned. So just a fun example of, of how we've, we've tried to bring the brand to life. And what are your what are your reasons for wanting to present yourself almost as a consumer brand, given the fact that you're you're selling large industrial equipment? Yeah, I love this question because I believe that all of us, you, me, um, the CEOs of the companies that we sell to, everybody is a consumer. 
people don't log on to a different internet at night because they run Shell or Exxon or CSX, right? So, you know, today information is so distributed. Once upon a time, not all that long ago, marketers could reach just about everybody they wanted to on three, four, five networks. It's pretty easy. I mean, God, maybe it would have been fun to be a marketer back then. I actually think it would have been boring, but nonetheless, today, how we all absorb content is so distributed. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, um, the CEO of one of our airlines is is um, looking at Snapchat every night, but we believe that by taking our content, making it approachable, making it interesting, making it relatable, and then, and this is the important, this is the other important part, putting it in the places where the right audience can find it, that's the way you market today. And, you know, you and I both know this. Facebook has, what, you know, a billion and a half, a billion six or so people who are on the platform. Facebook is the single best performance tool out there. It's a pretty good social media tool, but if you want to reach just about anybody, you can target them on Facebook. You can target them on LinkedIn. So, you know, we are looking to create content that tells our story. And then we're looking to distribute it in a way that matches how people are spending their time. And then to layer on top the, you know, the data, the analytics to be able to sort of super target them. If, if, does that make sense? Yeah. So you're, so you're very much into uh, segmenting by these different types of audiences. And so where does social, in your marketing efforts, uh, where does social figure relative to say, television or other yeah. channels? Yeah, so look, you know, we are steadfastly committed to being where people are spending time. Today, people still spend time watching television. I believe, we believe that um, where they spend time watching television is less important in some ways than where we have the greatest likelihood for them to not skip our commercials. So the formula we've tried to put together is one where we're looking for an audience that is likely, or at least not unlikely, to skip what we're putting on air. So that puts us someplace like Sunday Night Football, um, a live program where people tend to not DVR a football game. They're only, you know, 16 weeks a year. So we look, when we're on television, we look at live programming or late night. Those are our two favorites. But um, as I said before, as people's time gets distributed, our media gets distributed. So the percentage of, of weight, the percentage of money that we put on digital only goes up because the percentage of time that people spend on digital is only going up. At the moment, people are still watching television, and we will be on someplace like Sunday Night Football until they stop watching Sunday Night Football, at which point we won't be there anymore, right? You know, that's, that's a bit of how we think about it. Now, I know that uh, storytelling is very important to you and to GE. So maybe can you talk about that aspect and how does social media fit in? How do all the pieces fit together regarding uh, storytelling? Yeah, no, it's, it's, thanks. That's a good question. So um, maybe I'll give you two different examples if, if it's okay. And if I'm giving you too many examples, you'll just no, say. We love, we love examples. Cut, cut. Um, so um, what we try really hard to do is to find ways to talk about uh, our technology, what we're doing in terms of digital industrial, but frame it in a way that's inherently interesting, that has an emotional arc to it. And so I'm going to give you, first example is something that we did uh, rather recently called Unimpossible Films. And um, the idea here was we took popular idioms, a snowball's chance in hell, catching lightning in a bottle, talking to a wall. And because we at GE go to work every day, because we want to solve really tough problems, um, we sort of took those idioms as a little bit of a challenge and said, well, let's show the world how we solve tough problems. So we took, I'll, I'll take Snowball's Chance in Hell. 
So we went up to our, you know, we went to our scientists and we said, okay, you know, how, how can we take literally a snowball and show how the, our materials can withstand the absolute hottest temperatures? And we actually, Michael, thought about going to a volcano but it's kind of hard to get to volcanoes. So, um, so we, we created a film all around the journey of this little snowball, you know, to get to a, um, a big smelting area and be dropped into flames and, uh, and then do kind of a, you know, an opening of the, the contraption it was in and show that, that our materials can withstand the hottest temperatures and therefore this little snowball made it all the way through. So, you know, to me, and I don't feel like I told that story very well, by the way, but I think that, you know, we could talk about we've got great super materials that withstand heat. I guess that's a story. Um, or you can show this amazing film. And in this amazing film, you watch and you root for this little snowball making its way through. So, you know, when we think about storytelling, that's kind of an example. A, a second one, and this one, I, if you'll let me brag a little bit, um, I think I'm going to do it whether you let me or not. Um, this one I'm about to tell you about just, just won a, a big award at the Cannes Ad Festival, so I'm particularly proud of the team and the work they did there. So, um, back in the 50s, long before you and I were around, there was something called GE Theater that was hosted by Ronald Reagan. This was before he became president, well before. And um, it was incredibly popular. So we decided to kind of take a page out of GE Theater, but bring it all the way into the present. And you know, you and I know podcasting, audio, very, very popular right now. So we recreated this idea of GE Theater, but it was GE Podcast Theater. And we, um, uh, worked with some talent and created an original podcast series called The Message that was run over a period of, you know, six, seven weeks last fall. And it was very sort of sci-fi, War of the Worlds-like. It was a podcast within a podcast. And uh, it got to number one on iTunes. I mean, it did really, really well. Won this big award, you know, a week or so ago. So that's kind of storytelling. And, and if I can, I'll sort of finish this question by, by just saying, because I, I think if you're a marketer, you know, there are words thrown around like um, uh, content marketing, branded content, uh, sponsored content. And, and um, you know, to me, that kind of can mean crummy content. And so the bar that we try to use is just really good stories, right? The kind of story that would be just as good as as, um, oh, I don't know, um, House of Cards, right? You know, our standard is great content, not great branded content, because that feels like a, a, a little bit of a false compliment. So I'd like to come back in a moment to uh, talk more about stories, but we have a question from Twitter. And Zachary Jeans makes the comment that large companies tend to be defensive, defensive and slow on social media. And so how do you, how do you attain this, this agile status that you've been able to? Yeah, I mean, look, I think, Zachary, thanks for the question. I think if you're going to be um, slow and corporate, you probably shouldn't be on social media. That's my two cents, not you, but the companies that are thinking in, in those ways, because that's not how social media behaves, right? I mean, we all know what our feeds look like. We all know how quickly your feeds go by. So, you know, our social media team, terrific team led by a woman named um, Sydney Williams, who's fabulous, um, uh, works, with a, works with a group called VaynerMedia, and, and we're kind of always on, right? Which doesn't mean that we're tweeting at people 24 hours a day. That's I think a little, that can be a little inconsiderate. It depends on what you have to tweet about, of course. Um, but we're listening all the time and um, we, we're responsive. And, uh, you know, we all remember, I'm sure Zach, you do too, you know, that moment uh, in Super Bowl, what, a couple, three years ago where uh, there was a black, temporary blackout and Oreo was smart enough at that moment to send out a tweet. And, um, you know, they, I know the people there, you know, they had a war room set up um, or a football room set up and they were prepared to be spontaneous. If they had had to 
send their tweet during the, whatever it was, six minutes of the blackout back to headquarters for somebody to approve it, for somebody to, you know, do governance on, you know, you, you sort of create the right running rules, you have the right team, and you let them do a great job. Send. So that, that's what we've tried to do. But it's, it's a great question. I think a lot of companies probably do wrestle with it. And uh, no, so now going back to this, to this storytelling, you think a lot about stories. What are the components of a good story? Maybe you can teach us yeah, sure. on your experience. Yeah, yeah. So I think um, most good stories have emotion of some kind. It can be happy emotion. It can be wistful. Um, it can be droll. But I think, you know, you, you want to sort of root for somebody in a story. So the, um, you know, the Owen ads we were talking about a few minutes ago, you know, Owen is this lovely kind of quirky developer. He's, he's a nerd, right? He's got like his nerd glasses. You know, he's sitting there trying to tell us parents that he got a great job and his parents like every parent really have no idea what he does for a living um and you know even though it's it's short i mean it's 30 seconds still within there you have a protagonist you have a i guess an antagonist in the parents and you've got this arc of of humor and i think you know so what we look for in storytelling is an emotional hook um, we look for a little bit, and again, you can do this very quickly, of, of tension or conflict. And again, tension or conflict doesn't mean anger. It just means tension where you're, you're kind of rooting for an outcome of some sort. You know, there's, uh, there's that famous um, six-word Hemingway story. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, baby shoes for sale, never worn. I think that's the six words, right? Let's go with it. Baby shoes, never worn, for sale. I mean, that's kind of a perfect story, right? Because you're sitting there saying, huh, wait a minute, what happened? Was there a baby? Did it die? You know, all that sort of stuff. So you can, I say that even if I mixed up the words a little bit, because in six words, you can tell a story. In six seconds, you can tell a story. So I think the emotional piece, super important to us for GE, because you expect of us certain things, you expect perhaps corporate, you expect um, scale. We try to sometimes play against type because, you know, I, I um, kind of mentioned this earlier. To me, corporate's a, a bit of a four-letter word. You know, if something's corporate, it means it's, it's very sort of in the box and, and a little boring. Uh, I, 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 you know, a couple of us were talking about this the other day. It's sort of... Um, uh, you know, that's what we, we push against. So humor, uh, emotion, somebody you can root for, a little bit of tension. Um, th those are, to me, really important things in a story. And now when you are applying this to GE, again, you know, jet engines and power, power plant equipment, how do you, how do you integrate those pieces, which really are the domain of relatively few people, even though they touch all of our lives. Yeah. So, you know, um, there's uh, we were talking about this uh, employee earlier today who works at GE Rail. We make locomotives. Um, it's actually unbelievable. If Michael, maybe someday I can lure you to the locomotive factory. It's one of the great factories we have. Where in a heartbeat. <laughs> locomotive. Oh my God, it's just amazing. So there's a term for people who love trains. It's called foamers. I don't know if you've heard that before. It's like, I, I always think it's people who foam at the mouth, but I don't know. So um, this, this gentleman who works at GE, I think he's second or third generation GE. And every uh, weekend he takes his kids out and they bring long lawn chairs and they go and they love trains so much. They're such foamers that they sit and they watch the trains go by on a Saturday afternoon and they sort of make a picnic out of it. And I tell you that in part to answer your question because you know, there are super fans of some of what we do. 
right? So there are people who just become eight-year-old boys. I become an eight-year-old boy when I go to our uh, GE Rail factory. But there are people who just absolutely melt at things like trains and planes. And there's sort of this natural audience there. And whenever we can, we, we try really hard to play into that because it's, 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 it's a genuine passion point. It's like being a fan of Real Housewives, right? These are fans of, of uh, planes and trains. Um, the other thing we do, which again, I think is it's finding passion points. You know, maybe four and a half, five years ago, GE went up on Instagram. So again, back to this idea of, you know, early to discover. And we did it because, to your point, so much of, of what we do, these machines, are not necessarily in your life or my life. But there's a nobility, there's a majesty to, to machines. Um, and we kind of, forgive me, wanted to show, you know, big ass machines out in the open. So we um, that sort of became the beginning of our Instagram feed and is still very much a steady part of that diet, which is showing beautiful wind turbines, showing a, um, uh, a Yenbach machine, this big biomass uh, turbine. Um, we show them, you know, around the world. We invite people to do Insta walks, to walk through our facilities. So, you know, I think it's, it's a little bit of what you and I have been talking about, right? Some of it is how do you show, um, how do you sort of tap into the, the, the inner nerd, the inner geek, um, and get people excited about, you know, what, what it is we produce. Sometimes it's about telling a story and telling the outcome of that story, you know, what happens, um, um, you know, we shot films, for instance, of a, a young boy taking his first ever ride on an airplane in China. Um, sometimes it's the, it's the, um, the people who are um, using our technology. There's a, a doctor in um, uh, Japan who uses a jet ski to get to his patients. He jet skis between islands and he has a, a GE piece of equipment, a handheld ultrasound called a B-scan. And, you know, because it's very light, he can jump on his jet ski and, pardon me, that's how he uses this to um, <clears throat> offer ultrasounds to people in remote parts of, of the area. So I, I don't think there's one way that we try to sort of tell the story, but we do try to make the invisible visible in our storytelling. We have another question from Marsha mm -hmm. Elaine Walker. And let me tell everybody, remind everybody, we're talking with Linda Boff, who is the Chief Marketing Officer of General Electric, talking right now about storytelling. And you can ask her questions on Twitter using the hashtag CXOTalk. <laughs> so Marsha Elaine Walker, is asking, how do you develop stories that resonate globally? For example, the Middle East and Africa. And she's wondering, does Owen work worldwide? Oh, thank you so much, Maria Elaine, because I get to tell you, first, I'm going to start with Owen. Um, uh, so your question is a really good one. I The hardest part I often find of what we do is to figure out how to create stories that scale globally, but actually have a lot of local resonance um, and, and relatability. It, it is really a challenge. And um, so Owen is the great example. You kind of teed up this question for me, which is because this worked so well in the U.S., it's, it's probably been our most effective campaign in, in at least a decade, maybe more, based on the response and, you know, sort of the awareness that it drove. We decided that we could do this globally. So we went to France. And we cast this delightful young woman named Sophie and uh, created a film about Sophie as the developer um, in France. And it's working really well. We just launched it you know, a couple weeks ago. We're doing something similar in China. Um, obviously, in all of these instances, it's local language, it's local actors, it's local nuances, it's local in situ. Um, some ideas work that way, some do not. Um, in the case of uh, something I 
described a little bit earlier. I, I don't know, um, um, really, if you were on when I was talking about something called Unimpossible Films. But what we did there was we had an idea, you know, a idiom and make a film about, about this and how science debunks it. And we went to universities globally um, and said to engineering students, any students really, um, give us your idea. What's an idiom? And what's a scientific workaround that you'd like to see us bring to life? And we're going to take one of these and make an ad out of it this fall. So, you know, we work to do it. I think, you know, a couple couple other thoughts. I mean, I think you, you do need to pay a lot of attention to local nuances. It matters a lot. And at the same time, you know, we are all in a world where many of the social platforms that we are on, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, or global platforms. So it's that combination of, you know, taking advantage where you can take advantage of scale, but making sure that you're driving a relevancy that's culturally um, interesting and appropriate. So hopefully that's helpful to you. I appreciate the question. And we have another question uh, from Jill Rowley again, who apparently is at a helipad in Maui. I, I wish we were at a helipad uh, now. <laughs> could, we, could we ask you the question? Can we come join you? <laughs> that sounds good. And so, and she's, she said she was thinking about uh, predictive analytics and maybe, to, and that's, uh, and, and prevent, and using analytics mm -hmm. for preventive maintenance. And I know this is a little bit uh, off center from uh, we were just talking about storytelling, but we have just a few minutes left and maybe weave that into the picture because it's so important. Yeah, thanks so much for the for the question. I so wish I was you right now um, in Maui on a helipad. So, you know, um, there's so predictive analytics is really in in my way of simple way of talking about it, about creating a scenario with no unplanned downtime. If you're in industry, whatever industry that's, that is, and it could be operating a big food and bev facility or an elevator company or a, a health or transportation company, you really want to minimize your downtime. Downtime is bad. Downtime for people like us who want to go to the beach and read is good, but in industry it's bad. So what we've tried very hard to do, and I haven't really talked about this, but I will now, is to... Um, to talk about how GE, through this um, industrial platform we've created called Predix, is helping to create what we call industrial strength strength. So if you're um, um, operating a helicopter company, let's go with where you are and sort of extrapolate a little bit, and you want to store your data, that data needs to be secure, like crazy secure. It needs to be able to hold maybe petabytes worth of data. So the platform that, that we've developed called Predix is designed for industry. And as I say, we talk about industrial strength, strength, and we have been marketing this. In fact, we, I think, have a kind of clever idea. We, we sort of do um, a, a, uh, a bit of a roadblock every Tuesday. Tuesdays are the most productive day of the week, apparently. So we are running everything from cartoons to little crossword puzzles to radio ads. We've got some videos all talking about the importance of having an industrial strength cloud. And, you know, a big piece of this to, to your question is about predictability but predictability to drive the right outcomes. And I think that's increasingly the, the conversation we try to have as, as we are marketing what it means to be a digital industrial company. It's not just so that you can check the box and say you have analytics. Why do you have analytics? You have analytics so that you can optimize the amount of time you're performing well. That's what this is about. And you save time, you save energy, you know, et cetera. So I don't, all of a sudden I'm doing a commercial. I don't mean to be, but that's kind of the way we, we think about predict, predictivity, if you will. Linda, again, we have just a few minutes left, but in our closing minutes, can you talk about that, adding that layer of data and analytics on top of these big machines. What are the what are the implications for uh, GE and what are the implications 
for your customer? And I realize we could spend hours talking about that, but maybe just summarize yeah. it in a few minutes. So I'll, I'll try to summarize it and a, a bit tightly. So the first thing we did in um, in becoming a digital industrial company is um, is we tried it on, on ourselves, right? There's this expression in software, eat your own dog food, drink your own champagne. And, you know, for us, the, the first several years we've been involved in being a digital industrial company, it really has been about how do we make sure we're an industrial company? You know, we've got the advantage, Michael, of operating these big plants. So we know what it means. A, we have the sort of domain experience, right, in these, in these, in these businesses, but we also want to apply it to ourselves. So, you know, in using in using things like this Predix platform and using, I referenced this earlier, digital twin capability, we've created almost, we refer to this as a digital thread, right? Which is how do we make sure that our machines are connected and we are saving really hundreds of millions of dollars in doing this. And it, it goes back to, you know, what, what we were talking about a, a moment ago with, um, uh, uh, with Jill, which is how do you create more efficiency? How do you create more uptime by having machines talk to machines by seeing that ecosystem, you know, that to us is where things are, are not just headed. It's real today. Right. And we're seeing it ourselves. And I think maybe the greatest proof of concept, if you will, is we go out and, you know, talk to industry is the fact that, that we ourselves, GE, this big industrial company has become a digital industrial company. So therefore, you know, we're in a good place to be able to 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 help some others. And finally, uh, so GE, GE has obviously undergone this tremendous transformation internally. And so what advice do you have for other CMOs, chief marketing officers, who are themselves, their organization, undergoing this type of dramatic change? Yeah, I, I think, you, you know, I love this as a last question because, you know, there's that that expression, culture eats strategy for, for lunch. And I think the culture transformation is probably in some ways as significant as everything else we've talked about, portfolio, digital, industrial, et cetera. So, you know, uh, very quickly at GE, we've kind of adapted and learned from Silicon Valley a lot. We have something we call FastWorks that we kind of glean from Eric Reese, Lean Startup, um, David Kidder, you know, some people helped us with this thinking, but it kind of boils down to, to a few things. It's about iterating. It's about failing fast. It's learning how to pivot. Um, you know, I said this before in terms of being on the playing field, you know, you, you have to create enough in terms of what you're going to learn from, you know, minimally viable products that you actually can then, you know, realize that, oh, okay, this, this could be good or it could be terrible and we're going to tear it up and start again. You know, I would say more sort of, um, you know, as I, as I relate to it from, from our team, I think it's, um, it's giving people room to fail, but it's also making sure that when people fail, you're learning from it. You know, those are lessons that, you know, you know, startups are very big at postmortems. How do you postmortem what's happened, good and bad, and apply it? Um, and how do you take smart chances? You know, people have often, you know, when I talk to them, ask about you know the risk of of doing as much as we've done on social media. I think the bigger risk is not being on there because you know to to be um, a, a marketeer, to be a brand, to be a company, and not be communicating in ways that are contemporary, I think is a huge risk. I think you risk becoming irrelevant. So you know, hopefully, a couple helpful things for people. Well. That has been fantastic. I wish the time went by so quickly. I wish we yes. had another hour. We have been talking with Linda Boff, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at General Electric on episode 180 of CXO Talk. And Linda, thank you so much for taking the time and being with us today. Michael, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. 45 minutes went quickly. Next time on the Maui Helipad, right? That works for me. Everybody, <laughs> thank you. And we will see you again next time. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.